Good morning. Welcome again to Morning Devotions, and thank you again so much for our time together. What a privilege to sit down with God's Word together every morning. I taught you last weekend that God's Word is living, and it revives the soul. It brings life to our soul. This is why it's so important we read the Word of God every single day. We're going to get started today with Psalms chapter 9, verse 1. To the choir master, according to Muth Laben, a psalm of David. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. And notice that. Give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. When you give thanks to God, you don't bring God a piece of your heart. You don't, you don't say thank you to God with a distracted mind. Your whole inner being is involved in that thanksgiving. Now, now think with me. Have you ever been thanking God and listening to something at the same time, praying and listening to something at the same time? Then you know exactly what this is talking about. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. First of all, beloved, always come back and say thank you. God has been good to you. Come back and say thank you. But don't do it, you know, distracted and listening and thinking about other things with your whole heart. I will recount all of your wonderful deeds. He said, I'm going to think of all the things, all the wonderful things God has done. I will be glad and exalt in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. Now, now listen to David. He said, God, I'm going to rejoice in you. I'm going to rejoice in in you. I'm not going to rejoice in my problems, and I'm not going to rejoice in people. I'm going to rejoice in you, and I will sing praise to your name. I, I'm not going to praise a nation, and I'm not going to appraise a group of people, and I'm not going to praise the church. I will sing praise to your name. Now, now beloved, please, I, I know that sounds a little harsh to say, but too often in today's world, people sing songs about themselves. They sing praise to themselves. They sing, they sing praise to a government. They, and, and please, it's no different than the old Roman government demanding that the early church make you know, Caesar one of their gods. At some point, we have to understand, in Christianity, we sing praise to one, the Lord. When my enemies turn back, they stumble and perish before your presence. <laughs> you know what? Enemies will always attack, but they will turn back before God's presence. As God brings his presence into your life, enemies turn back. They stumble and they perish. So three things that happen to enemies. One, they turn back. Number two, they stumble. And number three, they perish before the presence of the God, not because of what you have done, but because of God's presence moving into your life. Now, every one of us have enemies. We have people that just lie about us and slander about us. And please forgive me, welcome to life. They did it to Jesus. They did it to the Apostle Paul. It's just a part of life. And what you and I have to learn to do is just not live our life upset about it. Just, okay, we're going to pray for the presence to come. And as the presence of God flows, let God arise and let his enemies be scattered. For you have maintained my just cause. Not, not my every cause, my just cause. There is a difference there. You have sat on the throne giving righteous judgment. You have rebuked the nations. You have made the wicked perish. You have blotted out their name forever and ever. The enemy came to an end in everlasting ruins. Their cities you routed out. Their very memory of them have perished. Now, David understood if he's going to fight the battles that God wants him to fight, there are going to be enemies, but it will be God who gives the victory and it will be God's presence that brings that victory. All right, let's open up our hearts and spend some time in worship.
Our Old Testament passage picks up today in Genesis chapter 27, down near the end of Isaac's life, in a very familiar passage. When Isaac was old and his eyes were dim so that he could not see, he called Esau his older son. So Esau was the elder. He came out first, maybe just by a minute or so, but he was the older, and said to him, My son, and he answered, Here I am. He said, Behold, I am old, and I do not know the day of my death. Now then, take your weapons, your quiver, and your bow, and go out to the field and hunt game for me, and prepare for me delicious food such as I love, and bring it to me so that I may eat that my soul may bless you before I die. I said, this was going to be the blessing. Now, Rebekah was listening when Isaac spoke to his son Esau. So when Esau went to the field to hunt for game and bring it, Rebekah said to her son, Jacob, now notice, we have a his and a hers. This is family division. Family divided, okay? Family was divided because one was the favorite of the father and one was the favorite of the mother. Now, folks, that is a recipe for family disaster. I heard your father speak to your brother Esau. Bring me game and prepare for me delicious food that I may eat it and bless you before the Lord before I die. Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice as I command you. Go to the flock and bring me two good young goats so that I may prepare from them delicious food for your father such as he loves. And you shall bring it to your father to eat, so that he may bless you before he dies. But Jacob said to Rebekah his mother, Behold, my brother Esau is a hairy man, and I'm a smooth man. Now notice, no discussion of right and wrong. Just a discussion on getting caught. There's a problem. But Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, Behold, my brother Esau is a hairy man, and I am a smooth man. Perhaps my father will feel me, and I shall seem to be mocking him and bring a curse upon myself and not a blessing. So Jacob wasn't concerned about right and wrong. He was just concerned about getting caught. Just getting caught. Only concern getting caught. Now, 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 folks, that's not a good attitude of heart to be in, all right? We should be concerned about right and wrong, not about getting caught. His mother said to him, Let your curse be on me, my son. Only obey my voice and go bring them to me. So he went and took them and brought them to his mother, and his mother prepared delicious food such as his father loved. Then Rebekah took the best garments, the vast garments of Esau, her older son, which were with her in the house, and put them on Jacob, her son. And the skins of the young goats she put on his hands and the smooth part of his neck. And she put the delicious food and bread which she had prepared into the hand of her son Jacob. So he went into his father and said, My father. And he said, Here I am. Who are you, my son? And Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. So we have a lie. I have done as you told me. Now sit up and eat of my game, that your soul may bless me. But Isaac said to his son, How is it that you have found it so quickly, my son? He answered, because the Lord, your God, granted me success. Now, there's a great truth that you got to get a hold of. Your God, not my God. At this point, Jacob had no walk with God. He had no walk with God. Then Isaac said to Jacob, Please come near me that I may feel you, my son, to know whether you are really my son Esau or not. So Jacob went near to Isaac, his father, who felt him and said, The voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. He said, are you really my son Esau? He said, I am. He said, then bring it near to me that I may eat of my son's game and bless you. So he brought it near and he ate and he brought him wine and he drank. Then his father Isaac said to him, come near and kiss me, my son. So he came near and kissed him. And Isaac smelled the smell of his garments and blessed him. The smell of his garments. So that's why the mother wanted him wearing Esau's clothes. This was more deception. See, the smell of my son is the smell of the field that the Lord has blessed. May God give you the dew of heaven, the fatness of the earth, and plenty of grain and wine. Let people serve you and nations bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers, and may your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you, and blessed be everyone who blesses you. Wow. 
This is the blessing. As soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, when Jacob had scarcely gone out from the presence of his father, Isaac, Esau, his brother, came in from his hunting. He also prepared delicious food and brought it to his father. And he said to his father, let my father arise and eat of his son's game that he may bless me. His father Isaac said to him, who are you? He answered, I'm your son, your firstborn son, Esau. Isaac trembled very violently and said, who was it then that hunted game and brought it to me? And I ate it all before you came and I have blessed him. Yes, he and he shall be blessed. Um, can't take black blessings. Can't take back a blessing. <laughs> There's a truth you need to get a hold of. As soon as Esau heard the words of his father, he cried out with exceeding great and bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me, even me also, my father, oh my father. And he said, Your brother came deceitfully. He has taken away your blessing. And Esau said, Is he not rightly named Jacob? For he has cheated me these two times. He took away my birthright. No, you gave it. But it's amazing. People always blame you for their bad decisions. Now, there's a truth to get a hold of. People blame others for bad decisions. He sold his birthright. And the scriptures are very clear about that. He did not not take it away. And behold, he has taken away my blessing. That is true. Then he said, have you not reserved a blessing for me? But you know, let's back up. Is it true or is it God's choice? Now that's a whole theological discussion for the book of Romans. Isaac answered and said to Esau, behold, I have made him Lord over you. And all his brothers I have given him to him as for servants. And with grain and wine I have sustained him. What thing can I do for you, my son? And Esau said to his father, Have you but one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, O my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. Then Isaac his father answered and said to him, Behold, away from the fatness of the earth shall your dwelling be, and away from the dew of heaven on high. By your sword you shall live, and you shall serve your brother. But when you grow restless, you shall break the yoke, break his yoke from your neck. Second blessing. Now, when you later study and look at Esau's life, um, you'll see that the Edomites, he became the nation of Edom. They did not live in a very nice area. It was not a prosperous area with with beautiful forests and grass and fields and things. Edom was not a nice area. But when you grow restless, you shall break his yoke off from your neck. Now Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which the father had blessed him. And Esau said to himself, the days of mourning for my father are approaching. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. So we have hatred. Hatred. You know, when hatred gets in your heart, there's nothing good that's going to happen. But the words of Esau, her older brother, were told to Rebekah. So she sent and called Jacob, her younger son, and said to him, Behold, your brother Esau comforts himself about you by planning to kill you. Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice. Arise and flee to Laban, my brother in Haran, and stay with him a while until your brother's fury turns away. Anger will cool. You know, I, I can remember many, many years ago, an old, wise Chinese man told me about people. You cannot put out a match when it's first lit. In other words, when people first explode in anger, you can't put out a match when it's first lit. Sometimes you got to let it cool a little bit. Until your brother's anger turns away from you. And he forgets what you have done to him. <laughs> yeah. Oh, this is one of my question marks. What you have done to him, Rebecca, you commanded him to do it. It's amazing. Here's a principle you have to learn. When people, here's a principle. When people get you 
to do wrong. You take all the blame. Now, there's something you need to get a hold of. When somebody manipulates you and gets you to do something that's wrong, you know what? You better think about that twice because they're not going to take any of the blame later. It's all going to be upon you. And he forgets what you have done to him. Then I will send and bring you from there. Why should I be bereft of both of you in one day? Then Rebekah said to Isaac, I loathe my life because of the Hittite women. If Jacob marries one of the Hittite women like these, one of the women of the land, what good will my life be to me? So the Hittite women, these are the women that Esau married. She didn't like these daughter-in-laws of hers at all. Chapter 28. Then Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and directed him, You must not take a wife from the Canaanite women. Arise and go to Pada Aram, to the house of Bethuel, your mother's brother, your mother's father, and take as your wife from there one of the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you, that you may become a company of peoples. Now here's another blessing. Here's a blessing given honest. There's a blessing given honestly. And may he give the blessings of Abraham to you and to your offspring with you, that you may take possession of the lands of your sojournings that God gave to Abraham. All right, now here's a blessing given honestly. So I ask the question, if, if they had just done things right, if Rebecca had gone to Isaac earlier and said, listen, I, want, I don't want my son to marry one of these Canaanite women, would this blessing have flowed then? I mean, please, this, this is a blessing given honestly now with no deceit involved. Thus Isaac sent Jacob away, and he went to Pada Aram to Laban, the son of Bethuel the Arminian, the brother of Rebekah, Jacob and Esau's mother. Now Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Pada Aram to take a wife from there, and that, he, and that as he blessed him, he directed him, you must not take a wife from the Canaanite women, and that Jacob had obeyed his father and his mother and gone to Pada Aram. So when Esau saw that the Canaanite women did not please Isaac, his father. Esau went to Ishmael and took as his wife, besides the wives he had, Mahalath, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Nabioth. All right, here is, you call this spite, okay? I know my father doesn't like this. I know my mother doesn't like this. So that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to stick my finger in their eye. Now, you know what? That's a bitter, angry heart full of hatred, okay? I mean, when you got a bitter, angry heart full of hatred, you, you do things that are just plain wrong. He did this just to hurt his father and just to hurt his mother. Now, now young people, can I please beg of you in Jesus' name? There are going to be times that you get mad at your mom and dad. There are going to be times that you don't like the decisions that they make. Don't ever let this attitude get in you where you just want to do something to just stick your finger in their eye. They don't like it, so that's exactly what I'm going to do. You know, there are people who do that to you in leadership also as spiritual fathers. You know, they just walk off and they say, I'm, I know he doesn't like this. I know she doesn't like this. I'm going to just do it because I know they don't like it. When people act like that, they got a heart full of bitterness, anger, and hatred. And that's not a good thing. When Jacob left Beersheba and went to Haran, he came to a certain place and stayed there that night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place to sleep, and he dreamed. And behold, there was a ladder set up to heaven. Now, later in the book New Testament, we find that Jesus is the ladder, okay? Angels ascending and descending on Jesus, the Son of Man. And there was a ladder set up in heaven, and on top of it, it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. So Jesus, Jesus is the ladder. Jesus is the entrance to heaven. And I would go over here later, and I'd put in that verse. I'd look up that verse and put that verse in. And behold, the Lord, you can just Google it, Jesus the ladder, and you can get the verse quickly. 
And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. So here's the promise to the next gen. But you know what? This promise passed before death. This is before death. Sometimes God will pass on generational promises a little early because of the circumstances, it seems. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east, to the north and the south, and in you and all your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. All right, so this is Abraham's blessing. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I promised to you. I like that. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. I will not leave you until I have done what I promised you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. No consciousness of God. And he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So early in the morning, Jacob took the stone that he had under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on it. And he called the name of that place Bethel. Sometimes we go there to Bethel. It's still there. But the name of the city was Luz at the first. And Jacob made a vow. Now here's making a vow. Before the law. Now, again, you know, there are people that want to go around and say Christians should never take a vow. Well, he made a vow before the law. We see vows being used during the law. And we see the Apostle Paul as a salvation by faith prophet of God taking vows. Okay, so vows, don't let people teach you that as a Christian you shouldn't take vows today. We should fulfill our vows but it is very biblical to make a vow. And he made a vow. He said, if God, notice the if, if God will be with me and will keep me in the way that I go and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then, number one, the Lord shall be my God. Now notice, my God. Before this, he called God your God. Now he's going to be my God. Now we have relationship. And this stone which I have set up for a pillar shall be God's house, a place of worship, established. And of all that you give me, I will give a full tithe, the tenth is the tithe, to you. And again, notice this is before the law. So tithing is before the law. It's part of man's relationship with God. Now, I just want you to notice here a man coming to God for the first time. Before this, it's my father's God, my grandfather's God. Now it's my God. God has made promises to him. So he said, all right, you will be my God. I, I, as a choice, you will be my God, not one of my gods, my only God. And I'm going to have a place of worship, and I'm going to be a tither. Three responses. Three responses to an encounter with God. You will be my God. From this point forward, I will be in the house of God. This will be my place of worship. And I will be a tither. These are the principles of coming to God before the law. These are eternal principles. All right. Let's open up our hearts and spend some time in worship. Begin. 
Our New Testament passage today begins in Matthew chapter 11, beginning with verse 20. Then he began to denounce the cities where most of his mighty works had been done. Now, not Jerusalem. These cities were Chorazon, Bethsaida, and Capernaum. Not Jerusalem. More mir- Maybe this is why I love being around Galilee so much. More miracles were done in the Galilee area than were ever done in Jerusalem. So he began to denounce the cities where most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. Because they did not repent. So goodness leads to repentance. Romans 1. But they did not repent. This is stubborn. Woe to you, Chorazon! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago with sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I tell you that it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom than for you. All right. Now, I want you to see a couple of things here. First of all, if you will go to these three cities, all right, in Galilee, they never flourished. They died. In fact, I've been to both places they call Bethsaida. Both of them are just 
ruins. Capernaum, you know, is a ruin. Corazon, a ruins. It, they're just ruins. And, it, and you just look at it and go, no. Tiberius, the Roman city that was like the Las Vegas for the Roman soldiers of that time, is still there. But these places where Jesus walked are no more. We never see a miracle in Tiberius. We never see that Jesus even went in. You see, to whom much is given, much is required. And please forgive me, there is going to come a day of judgment. And I think this day of judgment here is referring to the end of alls, okay? At the great white throne judgment. I call this the GWT, the great white throne. At the great white throne judgment, people are being assigned their punishment in hell. And they're being thrown into the lake of fire. And Sodom will receive lesser than these people that saw the miracles. That, that's an amazing thing to me. Verse 25. At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father. At what time? At that time. At the time when he pronounces this judgment. At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. So God hides things. God hides things and revealed them, and God reveals things. God hides and God reveals his choice. Yes, Father, for such is your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father. Wow. All things have been handed over to me by my Father. And no one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son. And anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. So Jesus reveals the Father. Jesus reveals the Father. Now here's the famous passage. Come unto me, all you who are labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So I like another translation of this. Come, on all, come unto me, all you who are worn out and stressed out, and I will give you rest. That's a promise. He will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Now, no, wait a minute. Take my yoke. This is a load to carry. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Why? For I am gentle and lowly of heart, and you will find rest for your soul. So taking the burden that Jesus gives you and learning from him. For I am gentle and lowly of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Why? Because it's his yoke. He helps carry it. Now, I often hear lazy preachers use this verse to say, you know, as, as pastors, we shouldn't work hard because after all, God's, God's yoke is easy and God's burden is light. And, you know, and, and I look at young pastors and I say, but you know, the church members, they work long days and they work hard. And then they see pastors sitting around being lazy. That verse is not about, that verse is not an excuse for lazy preachers who want to sit around and do nothing and get paid for it. This verse is not about that. It's about learning to come into his presence and pick up the burdens, pick up the load that he has for you. And when you pick up the load that he has for you, it's easy and it's light. Chapter 12, verse 1. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples were hungry. And they began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. Like walking through, they, you know, strip the grain off the top of it with their hand like this, and then they rub it together and eat it on peanuts, all right? When the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. And he said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry and those who were with him? how he entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for him to eat or for those who were with him. 
but only for the priests? Or have you not read in the law how on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. Wow. He said, now listen, guys, you're going to have to get a revelation here. He said, David did this because it was necessary for his men to survive. And God's interested in people surviving. And he said, you know, the priests, the priests have to work on the Sabbath. The priests can't just say, okay, we're not going to do anything on the Sabbath. The priests still had to offer the sacrifices and teach the people on the Sabbath. He said, if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. Wow. There is a reason for condemnation. And you know, there, there are some preachers, and usually they're young ones, that just, they think that they're so holy when usually they're just fighting with their own sins, you know, and, and they're full of condemnation in their heart. And Jesus said, let me tell you why, why people are so full of condemnation, condemning the guiltless, condemning innocent people, slandering and making up all kinds of lies, because they don't know that God desires mercy, not sacrifice. They don't understand that mercy is one of the most important things that God wants. <laughs> For the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. And he went on from there and entered their synagogue. Notice, their synagogue. Not his synagogue, their synagogue. And a man was there with a withered hand. And he, they asked him, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? So that they might accuse him. This is called trap question. Okay, trap question. Now, usually trap questions you can recognize because they, trap questions follow a rebuttal. Trap questions follow a rebuttal. He's just let them know they're wrong. Now they bring up another question to trap him. They're not done yet, all right? When people are trying to accuse you, they're never done. Get a hold of that. Accusations are never done. They're just looking for a new way to bring the same accusation. And he said to them, which of you who has a sheep, if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not take hold of it and lift it out? And how much more value is man than sheep? So it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And the man stretched it out, and it was restored healthy like the other. But the Pharisees went out and conspired against him how to destroy him. Now, that's one of the things you're going to have to figure out. When people are full of condemnation, they are also full of conspiracy. People full of condemnation are also full of conspiracy. How to destroy him, and they want to destroy leaders who disagree with them. Aware of this, Jesus withdrew from there, and many followed him, and he healed them all now. Three thoughts there. First thought. Withdraw from needless conflict. I've taught you this before. People will follow you. They'll follow you away from the needless conflict. Okay? So notice. Lead followers away from needless conflict. And he healed them all. Conflict does not change miracles. Conflict does not reduce the anointing. <laughs> it took me a long time to learn that one. You know, you, you could be in the middle of a huge battle and God heals and gives miracles. Conflict does not change the anointing. And he ordered them not to make him known. He said, okay, listen, let's, let's not have trouble for a little while. Let's just move on and be quiet. 
This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved with whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit on him, upon him, and he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel or cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. Jesus was not a Jesus was not an attacker. Jesus was not an attacker. Jesus was not involved with protests. Jesus didn't go up to Jerusalem and, all right, everybody, let's protest against these people. A bruised reed, he will not break. I like that. He doesn't crush. He does not crush the weak. You know, sometimes when you're strong, it's really easy to just crush people. A bruised weed, he will not break. A smoldering wick, he will not quench the same truth. Until he brings justice to victory, and in his name the Gentiles will hope. So already, I want you to notice truth. The gospel is for the Gentiles. So this whole concept of preaching the gospel to the Gentiles that Peter started, Jesus was already teaching this. All right, one more passage today. We'll get a little wisdom before we we stop today. Proverbs chapter 3, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 11. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof. For the Lord reproves him whom he loves as a father, the son in whom he delights, new living. My child, don't reject the Lord's discipline and don't be upset when he corrects you. For the Lord corrects those he loves, just as a father corrects a child in whom he delights. Now, don't despise, don't, whoops. Don't despise and don't be weary. Don't, don't, don't get upset with this at all. When the Father brings discipline to your life, it's because he loves you. This is a proof of love. Proof of love. For the Lord reproves him whom he loves as a father the son in whom he delights. Proof of love and proof of delight. When God's really delighted with you, (laughs) he'll bring correction to you because he always wants us to grow and be more like him. All right, we'll see you tonight. We're back in the book of Romans again. We'll see you at seven o'clock sharp in Jesus' name.